So in, in a sense, what I'll talk about uh, are the underpinnings for a framework uh, that would provide a sense of obligation uh, to carry out some of the reforms that Lindsay was talking about. Uh, my name is Rory O'Connell. I'm speaking on behalf of a team of researchers, Aoife Nolan, Colin Harvey, Owen Rooney, who carried out work generously funded by Atlantic Philanthropies um, some years ago. Uh, and our work, I should also acknowledge, uh, involved a fifth member, Mira Duchka, uh, who was a researcher with her project and now in uh, foreign fields in South Africa uh, when she's not off doing missions in the Arctic, uh, so obviously is not here today. Um, what I want to talk about then uh, it are some of the findings of this project, budget analysis and the advancement of economic and social rights in Northern Ireland. Uh, and in particular, the uh, implications of this for the right to housing. Uh, my colleagues and I agreed, by the way, that I would do the presentation to keep an eye on time, uh, but that then they will take the lead in fielding questions afterwards, and they may also want to uh, add to some of uh, my comments. But first of all, then, what is um, budget and a human rights-based budget analysis? Uh, and this is about using human rights principles, international law principles, uh, in order to analyze how the processes and the substance of budget decision making. Uh, and human rights based budget analysis can focus on any or all of these following uh, issues moving from the most general questions to very specific questions. Right? Can look at questions like how governments manage the economy and economic development, how governments generate resources. So, is this through direct taxation, through indirect taxation, through borrowing, through uh, grants, overseas aids development. More precisely then, how governments allocate financial and other resources, uh, and then actually spend those resources. Budget analysis can also look at the outcomes achieved by uh, such decisions and the processes of government in making these decisions. I suppose it's important to highlight that looking at the Northern Ireland context, not all of these issues are as relevant to the devolved authorities who don't have the primary levers in relation to the uh, management of macroeconomic questions. Uh, so our, the research tend to focus on some of the more specific issues. That is what budget work, budget analysis is about, but what we were looking at is how do you develop a human rights framework in order to understand how decision makers, politicians, the public sector, people in civil society should go about making these decisions, what processes, what principles, uh, what accountability mechanisms should exist. Uh, and in order to develop these frameworks, we decided to rely on a, a specific international treaty, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. We decided to rely on this treaty, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, or as we affectionately call it, ICESCR, uh, because the main human rights instruments in the United Kingdom, in particular the Human Rights Act 1998, does not really address the social and economic rights concerns that we were concerned with. Uh, ICESCR for us provided an international treaty that the United Kingdom has signed and ratified and so is obligated under international law to implement. It is also very useful for us because the United Nations Committee that monitors ICESCR has developed quite detailed guidance on what the requirements of this treaty are. And we found that extremely useful. Uh, and the guidance that we develop in our writings uh, revolve around these key principles, uh, some of which are obligations that highlight, I think, how uh, sophisticated, how subtle sometimes the international human rights framework is. Uh, sometimes in um, certain media sources, uh, one sees a caricature of human rights law as being that everyone should be given a house automatically, uh, no matter what. Everyone should be given access to uh, health care and made healthy, no matter what. And of course, uh, human rights law doesn't actually uh, put forward such unrealistic principles. What it does do is give us a set of principles uh, which are manageable. Right. And some of these principles are immediately effective, so states are expected to implement them today. Others are termed progressive obligations, uh, and we look to see how they are implemented over time. 
some of the key minimum, uh, sorry, some of the key immediate obligations are that the ICESCR committee has identified for many rights uh, minimum core obligations, the essential minimum, uh, the, my colleague Ethan Nolan nicely describes it as those elements that protect subsistence, uh, so the bare minimum that needs to be protected for everyone, uh, which are immediate obligations. There is an immediate obligation of non-retrogression. Uh, so if the state protects certain rights to a certain standard and there is a deliberate step backward from protecting uh, that, that right to that standard, then the state has the onus of justifying that step in the context of the resources available to it. There is a, an international law, a quite wide-ranging principle of non-discrimination, uh, which requires that policies that explicitly discriminate, but also policies that indirectly discriminate uh, must be challenged and again subject to justification. And the groups that are protected by the ICESCR non-discrimination principle are very wide ranging, so we're familiar with the groups that are protected under national anti-discrimination law under section 75, but the ICESCR guidance on non-discrimination is much broader than that. Uh, includes, for instance, issues about socioeconomic deprivation, uh, more explicitly certainly than we find in domestic law. Uh, and ICESCO also has a, a requirement of positive action. Right? The state must take steps to achieve equality. The state uh, also has procedural obligations, obligations to have a plan as to how it will fulfill uh, ICESCA rights, obligations to carry out surveys, to identify the extent to which rights are being respected, obligations to ensure participation and transparency uh, in how these rights are fulfilled. Moving beyond these immediate obligations, the state has a number of more progressive obligations that we look to see uh, are developed over time. So we should look to see is the state improving the right to housing, improving particular indicators such as Lindsay covered over time. Right? Are things getting better? Uh, and all of this is within the context that states are expected to devote the maximum of available resources to implementing uh, the rights in ICESCA. This means that, for instance, uh, if the state is devoting some monies to uh, a project that does not uh, implement human rights, uh, a vanity project of some sort, uh, while uh, programs to deliver on human rights are not being properly funded, there is an argument to say that the state is not using the maximum of its available resources in order to protect and fulfill human rights. Or, if the state or a government agency has allocated a certain amount of money to realize one of the ICESCA rights, and then for whatever reason diverts that money away from the realization of that right, or doesn't spend the money to realize that right, or ends up returning that money to the central exchequer, uh, that raises the question, has the state, has the government department actually used the maximum of the resources that were available to it? Those were the principles that we identified in the research based on ICESCR, but we also carried out a survey of some 14 examples of how this budget work, human rights-based budget work, is done in practice, uh, primarily the not exclusively looking at civil society organizations from the global south. Uh, and we identified some of the relevant tools. So good practice includes identifying the relevant budget lines in uh, budgets that deal with the realization of the relevant rights uh, and also identifying those that perhaps don't uh, realize rights or may even be inimical to rights. Identifying, uh, as we just mentioned, underspends or overspends or diversions. Uh, so identifying where money that could have been spent that was indeed supposed to have been spent on the realization of an ICESCA right uh, wasn't. Looking at how budget budgets change over time is a useful tool to consider how uh, the state is progressively realizing rights. Right? Uh, it's a useful proxy to see uh, is the state progressively improving uh, the protection of rights, though there are a number of important caveats uh, to that, uh, that it is only a proxy because spending money on something doesn't necessarily mean it gets better, and the money might be inefficiently spent. So we can't ever lose sight of the need to focus on the actual outcome 
Another important tool uh, was to analyze budget spends on realizing rights uh, as a proportion of the total budget or as a proportion of gross domestic product. Right? As a proportion of the total budget, it gives us a sense uh, as to whether the government is prioritizing the realization of human rights or prioritizing something else. Right. If the share of the budget that is allocated to social housing is decreasing, while other projects that don't immediately uh, go to the realization of human rights are increasing, it suggests a failure to prioritize the realization of rights. Uh, and the principles also, our other examples include the need to have a plan to address need. Uh, and we already had in the introduction earlier uh, the well-known example that it's been identified there's a certain need for new build in Northern Ireland to address housing need, uh, but it's not clear that those, that need is being met or even planned to be met. Finally and importantly, uh, budget work often looks to see who are the effective beneficiaries of spending of uh, particular programs, and this is particularly key to the non-discrimination principle that we mentioned. So these are the human rights principles. These are examples of the relevant tools that were used, uh, examples of good practice. Is this relevant to the work of assembly committees? And uh, we think it can certainly be relevant. Uh, to that end, one of the team conducted an analysis of the uh, assembly committees, in particular finance and personnel scrutiny of the last budget, a uh, 600-page document. And um, there are two things that interesting about that. The first was that nowhere in that 600-page document do you find the term human rights. Uh, but you do find quite a lot of uh, principles, quite a lot of issues which resonate strongly uh, with human rights principles. So committee members and committees uh, commented on the need to ensure adequate participation and transparency, and were indeed often critical of uh, the executive in terms of ensuring participation and transparency. Uh, committee members and committees focused on the need to protect the vulnerable, uh, which resonates very strongly with uh, the non-discrimination principle in international law. They raised questions about how particular projects were prioritized, which goes back again to this issue of using maximum available resources in order to realize, uh, pro pro uh, to realize human rights as set out in ICESCO. And the committee, the Committee for Finance and Personnel, also focused a lot on what they termed the social outcome Right? It's not enough just to spend money on programs, but this must have a real effect on the ground in terms of improving people's living conditions. Uh, and that also resonates very much with the human rights framework, uh, that this isn't just about policy and processes, though those are very important, uh, but must also result in the effective realization of rights for everyone in practice. So we think that the principles resonate with the scrutiny work already carried out by assembly committees. We also, in our project, looked to see how uh, you might apply these to some particular case studies. Uh, we looked at mental health, but we also looked at social housing. Uh, and uh, so some of the issues we raised there was the system for funding new build in the housing sector. Uh, and in particular, the reliance at the time and still on housing associations uh, as a means of levering in money that is sometimes uh, presented as being uh, free money to the exchequer. It doesn't cost the exchequer anything. Uh, but in fact, it's only possible because, in effect, uh, the public sector is foregoing uh, the rents that would otherwise come into the public sector uh, and that are now being used by housing associations in order to pay off loans. Uh, I'm very grateful to Lindsay for her analysis of the private rented sector and highlighting uh, the complexity of housing provision in Northern Ireland, because that underlines our points also that we have a multi-agency housing system where we have uh, the Department for Social Development, the housing executive, housing, a number of housing associations, and the private rented sector. Uh, but the issue that that raises is how do you ensure proper transparency and proper participation uh, 
uh, in such a complex system, right? You may have very good transparency rules that affect the public sector, but they may not apply so readily to uh, the housing associations, much less the private rented sector. Uh, so there's the need to consider how to ensure transparency and accountability in such a complex system. Uh, again, to go back to the introductory comments, there is a need to have planning that actually has a plan to meet the identified need. Right. Uh, we have a information from the housing executive that a certain amount of level of new build is required. We need plans to actually deliver on that. And we need to consider just how we manage the balance between public and private provision uh, and the state subsidy in effect for private provision in the system, uh, particularly when, as highlighted by the previous speaker, um, standards may not be the same. Uh, the effective enjoyment of housing may not be the same in the private rented sector as in the public sector. We think, and um, we said, would strongly encourage committees and departments to consider embracing a rights-based approach to policy making in this area. We think that a rights-based approach offers a number of key advantages. Uh, it puts the basis for analysis in terms of obligations and not just policy. So these are rights that people have an entitlement to, uh, not just privileges, not just commodities. Uh, the International Human Rights Framework provides details on what these rights means, provides uh, specifics uh, on what the right to housing or the right to uh, an adequate standard of health means. Uh, the Human Rights Framework contributes to the notion of good governance by putting the notion of justification very high on the agenda, insisting that when Governments take decisions that are retrogressive, um, that seem to go backwards, that they justify these in terms of, as Lindsay rightly said, an evidence base. The human rights framework also helps us to identify particular issues where there may have been gaps, where people may not have thought about uh, the implications of a rights-based framework, such as the need, for instance, to uh, deal with protecting the rights of tenants in the context of provision by private housing providers, or non-state actors, as we call them in international human rights law. And a human rights framework helps to ensure mechanisms of accountability, accountability through the political process, but also accountability through independent bodies, through courts uh, and other independent institutions. Uh, for, for these reasons, um, we are suggesting that a human rights framework is useful in policy making in Northern Ireland. And I'd just like to thank you very much for your uh, attention.